Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Just a couple of months ago, we profiled Congressman Jason Chaffetz, the Republican chairman of the powerful House Oversight Committee, which was poised to dig deep on wide-ranging investigations into government mischief. A few weeks later, Chaffetz abruptly resigned from Congress. We asked the oversight man what changed his mind. He told me it's more a matter of what hasn't changed. I started the interview asking him how he broke the news to his party leadership. I called uh, Speaker Ryan first, and when I talked to him, he wanted to try to talk me out of it, and I interrupted him, interrupted him and I said, Paul, I'm not asking for permission. I'm telling you that Jason and Julie Chaffetz made this decision. I, didn't, I don't report to him. I didn't get hired by him. I got hired by the people in Utah. So did, was, he, did he treat you a little bit like you worked for him? Well, he was just, please don't do this. Let's talk about it. Let's get together. And I said, look, we've already decided. It's just, it just wasn't really his decision, and I didn't need his input, quite frankly. I am tenacious and passionate about serving this country. After eight and a half years on an upward trajectory in Washington, D.C., Congressman Jason Chaffetz of Utah has suddenly and quite unexpectedly pulled himself out of the game. Committee stands adjourned. Some people might think this is a great time to be a Republican chairman of an important committee because Republicans control the House, they're the majority in the Senate, and they hold the president's office. Yeah. That means you would think the federal agencies can't stonewall investigations of yeah. spending, waste, fraud, and abuse. The reality is, uh, sadly, I don't see much difference between the Trump administration and the Obama administration. I thought these floodgates would open up with all the documents we wanted from the Department of State, the Department of Justice, the Pentagon. In many ways, it's almost worse because we're getting nothing. Um, and that's terribly frustrating. And with all due respect, the Attorney General has not changed at all. I find him to be worse than what I saw with Loretta Lynch in terms of releasing documents and making things available. I, I, I just, that's my experience, and that's not what I expected. What were some of the investigations that this committee was stalled on that you hoped could be picked up now that's not? been able to happen in terms of documents not provided by federal agencies. Look, we have everything from the Hillary Clinton email investigation, which is really one of the critical things. There was the investigation into the IRS, and one that was more than seven years old is Fast and Furious. I mean, we have been in court trying to pry those documents out of the Department of Justice, and still to this day, they will not give us those documents. And at the State Department? Nothing. Stone cold sides. To what do you attribute that? I think if, if we went to the senior most people, even the president himself, they would be pulling their hair out and they would hate to hear that. But within the bowels of the organization, they just seem to circle the wagons and think, oh, we, just, we can just wait you out, we can just wait you out. Well, they, they do. They do. Republicans were very upset in the last few years over the IRS Commissioner John Koskinen, mm -hmm. who they said allowed destruction of documents and yeah. investigations and other things. This committee, I believe, even called for him to be impeached. Yeah. He's still IRS Commissioner, even though Republicans are now in charge of pretty much everything. Why is that? Yeah, look, you had more than 50 Republicans pleading with President Trump to release him, uh, to let him go, fire him, uh, or at least encourage him to retire. No, he's still there. No changes, nobody was fired, nobody was prosecuted, nobody was held accountable. We tried to issue subpoenas, we tried to hold people in contempt, and the Obama administration said no, and the Trump administration came in and did zero, nothing, nothing changed. Do Republican leaders have an appetite <clears throat> to do the kind of oversight that needs no, to be done? No, no, I mean, the reality is there aren't very many people that wanna play uh, offense. There aren't many people who say, look, we have a duty and an obligation to fulfill the oversight responsibility that was put in place at the very founding of our country. Just the way you describe it, it's, it's troubling. Is Congress broken? Congress doesn't stand up for itself. I think it's, it's really lost its way. They say, oh, we'll use the power of the purse. That doesn't work. First of all, they never do cut funding. Even getting people to come up and testify before Congress the Obama administration, at the end of their term, they got so brazen, they stopped sending people up. They just didn't care. And there was no way to enforce that. And until that changes, uh, the, the legislative branch is going to get weaker and weaker. On full measure, we recently exposed the little-known party system on Capitol Hill where Democrats and Republicans are pressed to fundraise for their respective parties to pay six- and seven-figure dues, 
often soliciting donations on public time from the very special interests they're supposed to regulate. Does this mean immediately you have to stop trying to raise money? Oh, I love that part of it. Party dues, campaign uh, funds. Yeah. Look, as a position as a chairman of a committee, plus what I have to do with my own campaign, I have to raise about a million dollars a year. Maximum individual contribution is uh, $2,700. It's a that, lot of phone calls. It's a lot of phone calls and a lot of travel. You're putting in literally 16 hour days and then it's the weekend and guess what you got to do? Get on a plane and fly to North Carolina or Texas or California or New York and go raise and beg for money. And that consumes the weekend and next thing you know, you got to be back as a chairman, I'm going to be back Sunday night and, and then you've been at home for maybe five or six hours. Most people probably don't know that you never bought or rented an apartment here. No, no. So you sleep on a cot in your office. No, I really do. Time. And I do that to save money for our family. And like we get paid a very handsome salary, but it's not nearly enough to have a place in Utah and then in Washington, D.C., one of the most expensive cities in the world. It's just, I can't do both. I move these out. Okay. I spread these out like this. And then um, in here. I have my cot, so I have the cot. I literally just like, I roll it out like this and like this, and then I throw the mattresses on, on the top, and I can watch a TV oh, while, yeah. I, while I fall asleep at night. You have a flat screen. Um, but it's not the most comfortable wood. I got this at Walmart. Mm -hmm. It's more like a fake <laughs> plastic. <laughs> and it's not, if you see, it's not really flat, but. Okay. That's what you get for 50 bucks. Very good. And then this is what I usually eat for breakfast. And then there's not much in the fridge, but water and almonds. Popcorn. Water, popcorn, and almonds. That's all you really need. <laughs> I'm looking at the next year and a half thinking, I'm going to spend two to 300 nights away from my wife. We, we've been married 26 years. I love the work, but I, I truly just honestly happen to love my my wife and kids more. You're painting a pretty bleak picture. Yeah. It starts to look like maybe that weighed in somewhat on your decision to leave. Look, first and foremost, it really is a family decision. I, I love being engaged in the fight, but yeah, there, there does, after nine, you know, eight and a half, nine years, get to be a, a degree of frustration that, hey, when are we gonna get serious about changing these things? Because the American people, when I first started, they had Democrats who had the House and Senate and the presidency, and that whole pendulum swung, but I'm telling you, in the first five, six months, I don't see any changes. And that's, that's very frustrating. You come to that point and say, all right, it's, it's time for a change. As for what's next, Chaffetz said he's not ready to talk about it. He leaves Congress June 30th. Today, an exclusive first look at a new report that says you can put a price on success when it comes to Congress. The report by Issue One exposes the secretive money system in which members of Congress buy top spots on the most powerful committees. To raise the money, they often collect from the very interests their committees are supposed to oversee. Our cover story is the price of power. It's not only a powerful position, it's, it's a perverse system. In fact, it's the inverse of what we all as citizens should want. Nick Pennyman leads the group Issue One. Its new report, The Price of Power, exposes how members of Congress serve as cash cows for their party's political machinery. The best fundraisers are rewarded with powerful positions that decide the laws affecting all of us. Insiders report both parties have similar systems of dues that members have to pay every two years by raising money directly for the party, that's called dialing for dollars, and by giving some of their campaign funds to the party and to colleagues facing tough races. How much they raise determines who gets ahead. What we should want is that people rise in stature because of merit, not because of money. And right now it's money over merit. As an example, ordinary Republicans have six-figure party dues, but it takes more to make the ranks of leadership. How much does a committee chairmanship cost? So if you want to be the chairman of, uh, of a major committee in Congress uh, and you're a Republican, it, you've got to deliver $1.2 million uh, to the Republican National Congressional Committee. Democrats, it's about the same thing. It's almost like paying for the privilege of obtaining a certain position. It is 
borderline extortion. It's a far cry from bygone days. In the 1960s, a mere $100 donation could get you not only dinner with congressional candidate Shirley Temple, but also host Bing Crosby. Today, besides the $1.2 million required of A committee chairman, Republicans who chair secondary B committees are expected to raise $875,000 in dues. The top Republican in the House as Speaker has to raise $20 million, the number two majority leader, $10 million. Such details held tightly to the vest for years come from some of the 180 former public officials who belong to issue one's bipartisan Reformers Caucus and say they're sick of money's influence in politics. Former Congresswoman Connie Morella. I think we have reached a crisis proportions when it comes to money. A member of Congress devotes almost one third of every day to raising money. Former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle. People leave on Thursday, they come back on Tuesday, they try to govern on Wednesday these days, and you can't run a country this complicated with the challenges we face and spend so little time doing so. Former Labor Secretary Bill Brock. If you tell me that the problem of money in politics, the distortions that it creates, uh, it's just gonna keep getting worse, shoot me, shoot me. It's a flawed system, and it's like a nuclear arms race. The Democrats do more of it because the Republicans do more of it. Tennessee Republican Zach Womp co-chairs the Reformers Caucus. He was in Congress from 1995 to 2011. How are the members told how much money that they ought to raise? So the committees usually in the spring, and they just did this a month ago, they come out with a quota. And it basically says that if you're a chairman of a regular committee, it's X dollars. And if you're chairman of an A committee, an exclusive committee, it's even higher. So if there's enough money in your campaign account, you can just cut a check. Uh, or if you don't have enough money, you have to go over and what's called dialing for dollars. You sit in a little booth, they give you a list, you call people that you don't know who don't want you to call them, by the way, and you ask them for money. You tell them, we have this spring event coming up and maybe President Trump is going to be there and will you please dedicate ten or $25,000 or $50,000 to this dinner and they keep a total of it and you see people advance to committee chairmanships and into leadership based on how much time they spend during the workday, taxpayer expense, making calls, shaking down the special interest. With all that pressure to raise money, sometimes these committee members are raising it from the interest they're supposed to regulate, true? Well, not only do they, they actually intentionally give you those lists of people that have something to do with your committees because they know that they're the ones that are most likely to say yes. Doesn't that pervert the system by which the members of these committees become beholden to the very people that they're supposed to regulate or oversee? Of course, yes. Necessary for household wealth to grow. For example, the House Financial Services Committee oversees matters involving everything from Wall Street and insurance to the stock exchanges. The big joke in Washington is that the Financial Services Committee is called the Cash Committee not because it deals with finances, but because just being on it allows you to raise so much money from bank lobbyists and bankers that it's like an ATM machine. The cash just pours in. On the heels of the mortgage crisis, as the Financial Services Committee considered new regulations on banking and real estate, money poured in from those industries. From 2009 to 2016, the Republican chairman of the committee, Jeb Henserling, raised $10.1 million, half of it from finance, insurance, and real estate interests. He transferred $8.6 million of it to the National Republican Campaign Committee and other House Republicans. The committee's lead Democrat, Maxine Waters, raised $3.7 million, one quarter of it from finance, insurance, and real estate donors. She transferred about $798,000 of that to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and other House Democrats. Hensling and Waters didn't respond to our request for comment. If there are members on the Financial Services Committee and they're having to raise that much money and they're taking it from the banks they regulate, who's going to have the leg up when it comes to the kinds of laws that they support? The kind of sad joke in Washington is you lean towards the green. And when you're on the Financial Services Committee, let's say, and most of your money or a big chunk of your money is coming from bank lobbyists that you're supposed to be regulating, 
unfortunately, you're probably going to lean more towards what they want. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and National Republican Campaign Committee didn't respond to our repeated requests for interviews and comment. The system is so bad that the members hate it. Members of Congress hate to do it. The people they're calling hate to be called. What happens if they bucket? If someone says, I'm not going to raise this money? You won't advance, and they'll put their thumb down on you. They even ridicule you publicly at the meetings. This person is not making the calls. They're not raising the money. So while they might rather be taking care of the people's business, many spend countless hours catering to the interests that will help them pay their party dues. And I hate to use this word, but it makes prostitutes out of our elected officials. When the leadership says, if you want to advance, you have to demean yourself and go over there at taxpayer time and make phone calls to people that don't even want to talk to you, asking them for money for your party so that you can somehow advance the cause of good government. It really needs to change, and it's going to take the country because I can tell you they're not going to change it because they're stuck in this system and they're proliferating against each other, the two parties. Issue 1 says a simple solution that could be done immediately would be for the House to change its rules to say that fundraising cannot be taken into account when choosing committee members. No such plan is on the table. Today we begin with an extraordinary interview with a sitting member of Congress. It will make you mad, but it's something you should hear. Republican Ken Buck is speaking out of school about the shocking transactional nature of Washington politics, about party elites, he says, live like kings and govern like bullies. And he's lifting the curtain on why he says nothing gets done in Congress, describing collusion between Democrats and Republicans to fleece taxpayers on behalf of special interests. The game here is not to take a tough vote. Nobody wants to take it. And Democrats, Republicans, there's a, a quiet conspiracy going on that if you don't make me take a tough vote, I won't make you take a tough vote. A tough vote, says Congressman Ken Buck of Colorado, means anything that cuts spending or programs that benefit political and corporate interests. And the result is that the ability to cut federal programs or to uh, reduce spending in other ways uh, or to get our tax structure under control, simplify the tax structure, is, is very, very difficult. And, and uh, that results in higher spending. Nobody he says it's why Congress lines, consistently spends wildly more money sure than it receives from taxpayers. $600 billion last year alone. Why the federal debt has been allowed to balloon to record levels. The U.S. owes about $20 trillion it doesn't have on hand. Is there an element of Democrats and Republicans may appear to disagree on some things in public and yet privately they agree because they cater sometimes to the same interests? Sure. I, I, think, I think Democrats and Republicans disagree on some social issues and make a big deal out of that. And they disagree on some, some other major uh, uh, issues. But for the most part, uh, the, there, are, there is agreement behind the scenes not to make waves and, and to get things uh, done quietly. Not, not, not good things but things that involve spending more money. If, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch my back. Is what you describe what some Americans might call the establishment? Absolutely. The, the establishment are uh, the, the Republican leadership and Democrat leadership getting along and pretending not to, but, but clearly getting along. A former federal prosecutor, Buck has been in Congress less than three years. He says his education from Washington, D.C. School of Hard Knocks began right after his election during his orientation trip to the Capitol. And that's when a lot of the rules were explained to us about the dues to the NRCC and uh, other requirements. He was stunned, he says, to find the NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Committee, just like its counterpart for Democrats, requires hefty party dues, especially if members hope to aspire to meaningful positions. Talk about a record $30.1 million right here in this room. Give yourselves a big round of applause. It's uh, mildly offensive to think that uh, to uh, serve on a committee in Congress, you need to pay a private political organization uh, dues, and, and that's, what, that's what they were asking for. Did you have any idea before you were elected that that was the case? I did not know that there were mandatory dues here, no. How did they tell you? 
Uh, well, it's not a big secret. <laughs> they, they have a big chart in, in uh, uh, the National Republican Congressional Committee offices, and you can see uh, everybody's name and, and the dues that they owe and, and how much they paid. What was going through your mind when you started to hear this news? Well, as, as freshmen, we have to raise $200,000, and that's a lot of money. You know, I just finished campaigning and, and raising money, and, and now I had to go back to donors and uh, ask them for money again. Buck reveals the unwritten rules and outlines his allegations in his book, Drain the Swamp, How Washington Corruption is Worse Than You Think. He says to meet fundraising quotas, members of Congress spend hour upon hour of public work time asking for money from the very interests they're supposed to oversee ending up beholden to them instead of the public at large. For people who really have no idea how things work up here, can you tell us how the special interests and corporate interests, for example, actually influence members? How does that happen? It starts with committee assignments. If you're on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the uh, transportation bill will come before your committee and all over town there will be receptions and the members on, on the transportation committee will be invited to those receptions, expected to attend those receptions uh, and receive uh, donations as a result of that. They know that the, the easy money, the low hanging fruit is going to be at uh, receptions uh, that, that, are, that are given right before a major piece of legislation goes to committee. Uh, everything is called across the street because the capital behind me, uh, you can't accept money there and you can't give money there. But uh, once you walk across the street, then uh, then the bags open up. Restaurants around here? Restaurants, the, uh, for the Republicans, the Capitol Hill Club uh, has a lot of different receptions and dinners. Industries paying for those receptions and dinners include tobacco, telecommunications, pharmaceutical, TV broadcasting, beer and wine, defense and Hollywood. Democrats have their own fundraising hangout nearby, the National Democratic Club. I've attended receptions where I've had 10, 12 different uh, corporations represented, and they have made their case to me on why they need me to vote a certain way on a piece of legislation. And I know that if I accommodate them, I will uh, have a reception later on where they will support me. You're describing an entire system where almost every consideration that ought to be for constituents is instead about special interests and corporate interests and donations. It, it surprised me when I got here, and, and I've been involved in politics since I was a teenager, um, and, and getting to this place is, is really shocking to see the influence that money has uh, in politics. Early on, Buck challenged GOP leadership regarding a vote he felt would give President Obama too much power on trade issues. Republican leaders retaliated by trying to oust him as president of his freshman class, but he went on a public offensive and survived. He says he's watched colleagues get punished for doing what they think is right instead of what party bosses demand, booted from committee positions and even denied dining room privileges. The incentive structure right now is to vote for more money. You never vote for less money because someone's going to get mad if you vote for less money. And so as long as, we, uh, as long as the American public doesn't stand up and demand that members of Congress are accountable, uh, Congress will continue acting the way it does. Do you think a lot of people come to Washington really hoping it will be different and planning to work for their constituents and just find out 